Um, so now I uh, turn over the uh, stage to Muli Peleg. Muli, if you want to uh, share your screen, you should be able to do so. You're also unmuted. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you and we can see your screen. Okay, so uh, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure and honor to be with you guys uh, today. And thank you, uh, Ron, for inviting me on board. Uh, just a few opening remarks. Um, I'm delighted about this initiative. I believe it's important, it's significant, it's imperative to the Israeli social sustainability. The um, theoretical foundations, as I found them, are sound and integrate well with each other to create a developing and cumulative practical theory, which is rigorous and invigorating. I was invigorated by it. This is especially worth noticing on the background of the relative paucity of the theoretical and practical engagement in the field of Jewish-Arab relations in Israel and in the region. Yivat Chaviva, as I am familiar with it, stands out as a consistent beacon in its relentless effort to spearhead any kind of progress in this existential domain. I commend the courageous and broad thinking and the attempt to harness it down to reality, which is usually a weak point in, in such attempts. This is a bold and uh, sometimes audacious attempt, perhaps too much so at times. I admire the efforts not only to think outside the box here, but really to think without a box at all. And this is quite an achievement in an enduring practical reality where change is perceived often as risky and imprudent. Having said that, I keenly approach this book from two perspectives that have captured my writing and research in recent years, the social sustainability and the conflict transformation slash peace building perspectives. In both respects, the shared society vision as presented in this book is relevant, but also inviting some critical thinking. So just to uh, introduce those two perspectives, um, this is, I think, the quintessential definition of each. Social sustainability occurs when formal and informal processes, systems, structures, and relationships actively support the capacity of current and future generations to create healthy and viable and livable communities. Socially sustainable communities are equitable, diverse, connected, and democratic, and provide a good quality of life. Notice the words that I blocked out and read. Conflict transformation perspective. This is from the classical book by John Paul Lederach. Conflict transformation must respect and promote the human and cultural resources from within a given setting. This involves a setting, a, set, a new set of lenses through which we do not see the people in it as the problem and the outsider as the answer. I worry that the vision presented in the book hasn't fully come to term with these aspects. So let me delve further into it. Let me parse out my concerns into two major categories, which I think weigh considerably on the overall picture, the antecedent conditions and the applicability or the feasibility of this audacious undertaking. So let's, let's start with the antecedent conditions. And I think one major issue here is parity. And, and uh, I'm uh, tapping on, I'm uh, uh, relying on some of the things that the previous speakers have mentioned. For the move to partnership to succeed, parity, as I see it, is prerequisite. This is akin to Rose's veil of ignorance. Anybody who knows that, probably most of you, what does it mean? It means playing down or ignoring the context, which is there, the historical, the cultural, the political, the economic, the emotional, the psychological, what Mitchell used to call the hidden dimension of an intractable conflict. It means barring outside intrusions and pretending this enterprise is orchestrated in a vacuum. <laughs> Uh, somebody else is speaking with 
I just muted them. People, please keep your microphones turned off. The, the need to relinquish or to abandon a priori all biases, entitlements, accusations, victimizations, demonizations, and vilifications. These are factors that play over time during intractable conflict because they intensify group cohesion needs, identity needs, and the uh, persistent sense of belonging, purpose, and meaning. This is what I mean by trying to consider very hard the antecedent condition, the prior conditions. The other element here is common interest. This should not be taken for granted. Because before empathy, before solidarity, and the vision of joint future, which are uh, essential elements, common interests or superordinate values must exist. And my question is, do they exist? Are they tenable? Are they defensible to the extent that once a challenge emerges, they can hold the union, the partnership? Are they understood in an identical manner? I mean, here, uh, communication, language, cultural, precepts are very, very crucial. Do both stakeholders understand things like partnership, uh, commitment, responsibility, um, um, conflict resolution, normalization, the same way? We should not take those things for granted. As far as the applicability issue, I see some um, various difficulties along, uh, and I, I, uh, I cluster them into groups of difficulties, consolidate them, consolidated them into categories, issues of trust, uh, which I find uh, that uh, might emerge galore in big time. What criteria and standards of trust can be established with all the negative images, stigmata and generalizations which still persist? Issues of reciprocity. We have relative power issues here, absolutely. We have uh, claims uh, of rights from both sides. We have persistent and deepening fears. We have issues of status. Everybody claims the land, the country as his own. We have issues of rightness. This is a very crucial point. Due to the long protracted conflict and the lack of independence, is it not premature to envision a shared society? And here I ask, what is right? What, what is meant by being right? Are the two sides equally prepared and want this change. Then, right following from this, there are issues of maturity, maturity for all parties involved. Are they beyond Kagan's fourth stage, moving from self-authority and, and their own subjective truth to interpersonal? Very difficult uh, transformation. Issues of expansion, how to increase the circle, how to mobilize and reach out, how to make this from a Givat Chaviva model to a societal model. And, of course, from the previous uh, worry as well, issues of context, setting, background, situation, they all still prevail in the community, state, regional, and global level. They all need to be taken care of. Now, let me hone it down to a more specific uh, questions and, doubt, and doubts uh, lens. Um, for example, collaboration. It hinges upon trust, mutuality and new understanding of agent, of other, and of relationship. Is this feasible? Shared space, this is mentioned in, in the book uh, a couple of times. Is there a shared place? Arabs and Jews live separate lives. Go back to Smoha's uh, writings. Living space, educational, religious, cultural, ethnic spaces, they're all separate. The only time Jews visit, forgive my, sarc my sarcasm here, the only time Jews, I'm, I'm generalizing, I know, on the only time Jews visit Arab villages is to have homos, usually at the entrance of the village. The only time Arabs visit Israeli homes is when they build them. And, and this is very concerning to me, and, and it should be concerning to the team. Common new culture, how to acquire, cultivate, and sustain a common culture. And I want to remind you Clifford Beard's uh, classic definition of culture, a system of inherited conceptions expressed in symbolic forms. Inherited conceptions. How can common culture be developed alongside with uniqueness of heritage? Culture is so subjective, it's so local. And then ripeness, stakeholders at dissimilar levels of preparedness, readiness, and willingness. More initiative on one side can stave off and antagonize the other. How can ripeness be balanced, be developed and maintained at the same pace? 
And this is a very crucial point, I find it, very central. Standard Ashitufi is called in the book, and I call it ground zero partnership. The point where all preconditions are abandoned and each party is clean slated. Is it possible in light of the emotions, the fears, the anxieties, the, the, the historical experience? So in order to be constructive, this is what I meant to express here is constructive criticism. I want to forward, I want to suggest some uh, three uh, theoretical uh, perspectives that helped me a great deal in my research, in my project, mainly uh, the one that I did in Ramle, uh, in the mixed uh, Israeli town of Ramle, and uh, in Tanzania, in Dar es Salaam, between Tanzanians and Zanzibarians. Uh, and I dealt there with the intercultural and interfaith dialogue. Uh, we're trying to bring uh, uh, factions together and try to create something new in an interactive model. So the first uh, uh, framework that I want to suggest is instrumental versus substantive community. These are all things that I've written about and I want to show how they correspond with themes and terms in the book and what is required in order to uh, make them relevant to uh, continue and develop the shared society model. So instrumental versus substantive community. Instrumental community is like a contractual uh, community uh, social contra uh, contra the social contract uh, theory, when uh, different factions, different people, different minorities come together in order to create something bigger, but they don't have a substantial need in maintaining the community. The community is only a mean, an instrument to overcome external threats, the state of nature, a la Hobbes. A uh, substantive community is the real willingness to maintain and to uh, cultivate a new community which is more than the sum of those who are integrated in order to stave off some external danger. So it corresponds with uh, the notions of common space and shared language. And what it re is required here, and I, I, I emphasize this because I just to, to uh, uh, mention or to uh, show you the difficulties that are imbued here. Unity of convergence of purpose, belonging, joint, joint vision of the future. It takes a change of image and meaning of self, of other and relationship. And we know from history that conflict always help to, burgeon, to, to uh, solidify and to intense the, uh, the image of the self and of the other. The self is good, the other is bad, of course. Here, we need to reshuffle all those images, and this is not easy. Then another uh, perspective is normative dialogue, which really put its uh, emphasis on trust and identity. I, I just mentioned here all Ramlians. We made a big leap forward in the Ramla uh, project because at the beginning, everybody was identifying themselves in opposition to the identity of the other. I am Jewish. I am Muslim, I am Christian, I'm Israeli, I'm Palestinian, I'm this and that. At the end of the project, we took another questionnaires and the first thing, the first uh, factor in their identity poll became we are all Ramlians. So this was possible only because they had a sheer and direct and brave normative dialogue, not a procedural dialogue, but they talked about the most important and painful things. So this corresponds with ideas such as Sutafut Liba, core partnership and identity discourse. And this is what needs to be done, grappling with issues of identity and trust, which are tough, courage to be open, discuss, adjust, and perhaps compromise core beliefs, values, and norms. This is not easy. And I've seen it. I've seen the pain and the difficulties in this. And lastly, I want to mention something that Ron is very, very Excuse familiar. me, Molly, we have two minutes. I, I'm going to finish in about a minute and a half. And then for the last half minute, we can dance. Um, so CMM stands for Coordinated Management of Meaning. And I was fortunate to be part of the pioneering group uh, of this, uh, of this, um, of this uh, uh, interesting and mind-blowing at times uh, research and, and uh, perception. CMM taps into and touches upon the ideas in terms of coordination of meaning, co-evolution and co-construction that Ron, Ron mentions uh, various times along the book. And this is what it takes to have CMM. CMM basically relates to, uh, this is what the, the communication perspective means. Communication is not an instrument. 
is not just an interaction back and forth. It's the entire meaning of existence. This is how new social worlds um, are created. We cannot operate alone. Robinson Crusoe was nothing until Friday swam, swam into this island. And then a social reality, a social world was created. We need partners. We need our previous foes to become our partners in order to enrich and build around us and around them as partner a new social world. We need to establish an ability to co-construct a new social world, which is a very difficult and sometimes daunting task. So I'm done here. What I have to say to Ron and to the team, this is a great beginning. It's uh, heartwarming and encouraging. And please, please continue the job, even though there are lots of uh, hurdles on the way. I mentioned only some of them, but they are doable. They can overcome and you are definitely on the right track. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, Muli. Um, I see that uh, some questions have come up in the uh, chat. The audience is welcome now to write additional questions if you have them. We have a few minutes to, uh, to respond to them. So I'll uh, um, go uh, over. Uh, Mary, uh, first someone is asking for the title of the Neuroscience and Peace Building book that you mentioned. Zoe Eisenberg is asking. And there's another question that's asking uh, by Alisa Meyer Epstein asking you to please explain what you mean by using human rights to fight a war. Um, Hang on, I need to un unmute you. Hang on. For some reason, it's not letting me unmute you. Unmute myself. Oh, oh, yeah, okay. here you go. Okay. okay, go ahead. The title of the book that has just, the manuscript has just gone to Oxford University Press, and the title is Neuroscience, War and Peace. And it's based on my social psychological uh, courses that I've been doing in Brandeis. And it's taking a very different approach to conflict. Basically, a lot of it is about un unnoted feelings that we ourselves have and that we're often controlled by them and need to take them into account. The second one <clears throat> was fascinating. We've had a big tension in Northern Ireland between the human rights community and what we, the community relations community, the relationality community. And one of the problems was the human rights people felt that the relational people were being too soft and the relational people meant that felt the human rights were being too confrontational. And this came to um, a, a head when we wanted to create a new human rights um, const constitution for Northern Ireland. And we held um, a lot of meetings around in terms of Protestants, Catholics, others, to see what they would want to emphasize. And particularly when we brought them together, each group would come saying um, that theirs was the prior human right. In other words, the, uh, the, the, there was a lot of uh, poverty, more poverty among Catholics, but Protestants would say, we've got a lot of poor as well. You know, you don't, you ignore that. Or they would say, um, the whole question of identity, Protestants would say, our identity is being ignored. Catholics would say, our identity is being ignored. And they would choose human rights to bash each other up with. So in other words, there is an interesting book called The Last Utopia about human rights. And it's basically, many of you may have noticed that human rights has become less important in public discussions over the last few years. And I think it's because of debates like this, where in fact it became an instrument of war rather than what was hoped to be an instrument of peace. And if you have time to read the book, I recommend Human Rights, Northern Ireland, um, A War by Other Means. Okay. okay uh, thank you. Uh, Muli, there is a question here. Uh, what did you, uh, if you could say some more about what you did in the walk in Ramle and where people can learn more about that project? Well, the, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, the uh, Ramle project was funded by Columbia University and it ran from uh, 2011 to 2014. And um, I wrote a chapter about it in, in a book that came out uh, last year. And I intend to expand this uh, chapter to an entire book. And this was basically um, 
working with a core group of 30 uh, people, 15 Jews and 15 uh, Arabs. And uh, the Jewish group was uh, diverse, diverse and, and the Arab uh, group was diverse. Romney is a fascinating place. It's 64,000 people, but it's an entire universe. And we brought um, people, uh, you know, we, we weren't looking uh, to, for, for, you know, to preach the choir. So we were uh, looking for right wingers, uh, for uh, absolutists, um, for people who had uh, a great deal of antagonism and animosity uh, towards the other because we wanted to measure change. And we worked along the, uh, the uh, axis of uh, change uh, of attitude, change of opinion. And, and lastly, uh, we went out uh, of, uh, to service projects when for the first time, Jews and Arabs from Ramle uh, worked together. Um, they don't live in the same neighborhoods. They don't go to the same schools. They don't go to the same playgrounds. The only time they meet, used to meet before our project was the market. And even then they just say hi and just walk past each other. Um, so, um, and, and we wanted to expand this to other mixed towns, but uh, the budget was gone. And Columbia was more interested in, in writing an article about it. And I was more interested in, in changing uh, whatever I could, the, uh, the reality. So these were two uh, passing ships. Uh, and uh, I went uh, to Africa to continue the same mode of, of exploration. But it can be read in this uh, chapter. And I can send you, uh, Karen, the, uh, the link to it. So whoever wants it, uh, you can give it to them. Yeah, if, if you want to, you can, uh, after we're finished answering the questions, put it in the chat and then everyone can... Uh can see it. Absolutely. Here. Um, okay, Alan, the, there weren't questions for you before, but there's actually a question for you now. Uh, I I'm forgot here. to say that, yeah, the question for Muli was from Sharon Perez, and the, there's a question now for Alan from Alex Chichelsky, who's saying that Muli is missing many reasons why uh, shared society cannot be developed while power inequalities continue or, or formally discussed, and um, Alex is asking for your response to that. Yeah, um, I'm not, I don't think it, that it has to be discussed in order to be able to uh, uh, move to shared society. It is part of the process of building and developing shared society. Some questions cannot be discussed just in the shut and closed room. As a dialogue advocate, I say, do no harm and do not enter certain conversations when there's no ripeness. Muli, you mentioned also the question of ripeness. I will say ripeness is when we're able to contain the tension in a way that does not create the, the, the withdrawal to these separate spaces in an adversarial manner in which, you know, each one of us is entrenching in his or her own identity, shutting down from the other. So some of the questions, the deep questions, the profound questions of Israeli future, our identity as a whole, the tension between Jewish and democratic state, and so on and so forth. Sometimes we would say too early. Three years into the program with one of the partnership, we went to Jaffa to see the play uh, Haoda, what is it called? Um, wonderful play about uh, 1948, things that, that took place. And, you know, after that, Mayor said, too early. I wanted to take advantage of this, of this situation to surface certain questions that have to do with narratives and identity and histories. Mayor said, too early. And I respected that. They didn't do that only for the sake of saying we want to avoid, but from a constructive perspective, they said, we're not there yet. So I could relate and appreciate to that. And this is something that is highly important. And I think I gave a couple of examples with the Wadi Miska project and other projects where we are striving towards a substantial change in power relations, access to power, being able to build infrastructure, to be able to pick up the phone. You know, I have a municipality engineer from an Arab community saying, you know, Arab municipality telling me, the, the planner says, you know, now I can just pick up the phone and call these and these people that I didn't have access to before. This is access to power. This is having connections and ties, which changes on the ground, not in theory. It changes power relations bit by bit, piece by piece. And also, I would like to add to that, that when we talk about the relational model and developing the dialogic mindset 
and the mindset of partnership, it's not about dialogue for the sake of dialogue. It will not go back to people to people. I heard too many times Arabs telling me and they're right, we're sick of tired of hearing about dialogue, but they mean dialogue from a contact perspective, which is dialogue for the sake of knowing at the end of the day, uh, you know, they, Muhammad, you probably will mention Muhammad Arabs, you will probably mention that afterwards. I get, go back home to my home, you go back to your home, you're doing fine and I'm staying in the same condition. So I, we're not interested, we're sick or tired of dialogue understood this way. Dialogue, as I brought it forth, is about sharing power. Sharing, it's a co-construction, constructive activity. From a CMM perspective, you know it as well. Muli spoke about it as well. It is about how we jointly affect the creation and the construction of reality. There's nothing more power equal than that if we get there properly. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I see that there are more uh, questions in the chat, but we are uh, just about out of time. So maybe we can uh, pick them up later on. Also, our speakers can have a look at the chat and if they want to um, communicate with the people, uh, they can uh, do so. So once again, let me um, thank all of our speakers very, very much for taking the time for being able to join us, for all of you for joining us. We're going to take a 15 minute break. The meeting will stay active and you can join us. Those of you who can uh, understand Hebrew are welcome to join us again at, uh, at four o'clock for, uh, for the round table of the uh, practitioners. Um, again, thanks everyone for joining. And um, let's take a break and come back in a few minutes. Thank you. <laughs>